What quantities do we need to describe motion? If we asked 100 people this question, I bet we would find that many people agree we need information about distance and speed. Maybe a few would mention acceleration, and maybe some would also say that we need information about direction as well. As it turns out, it's the direction that differentiates the quantities that we typically associate with motion with those that are necessary to actually do meaningful calculations to describe motion. In physics, the quantities that we use are displacement, velocity, and acceleration, and they are all vectors. They have a magnitude and a direction. This is really important, because if you think about it, when you want to tell your friend how you are going to get from class right now to lunch in 15 minutes, telling them that you are driving 5 miles isn't really helpful. You need to tell them 5 miles north or something like that. The magnitude is only useful if you include the direction. This is why in physics we describe motion using the displacement, velocity, and acceleration vectors as opposed to scalar quantities like distance and speed. So what are these quantities and how do we determine them? Imagine that you are standing at some point in space, let's call it Eastern University, and walk to another place, let's say home. In order to describe this motion, first we need just a little information, a coordinate system and a reference point. In 1D, our coordinate system is usually just a line that we label X or something, and we are free to choose where the reference point or origin sits on our line. With this information, we are good to go. First, the displacement is the vector difference between the final and initial positions. Let's say the position of eastern is 1 km in the positive x direction, and the position of home is 6 km also in the positive x direction. Then if I go from eastern to home, my displacement is equal to the position of home minus the position of eastern, or 5 km in the positive x direction. You know this is a vector because I gave you a direction, the positive x direction. Think about what the total displacement for your trip would be if you started at campus, went home, then went back again. Since it's only the starting and ending points that matter, it would have to be zero. This is the main difference between a distance, which is not a vector, and a displacement, which is. If you broke up the trip into two segments, one going towards home and one going back towards campus, and found the displacement of each segment, then you would still get a total displacement of zero if you add the two segments together. You were going in the positive x direction during the first part of your trip, but in the second half, you were going in the negative direction. The direction is important. Next, let's talk about velocity. Velocity is the rate of change of the displacement or in other words, the displacement divided by time. Whenever we describe a quantity using the phrase rate of change, you can bet that you'll have to divide by time at some point. Using this basic definition, we can see that the units of velocity must be length per time, or in SI, meters per second. When we say the rate of change of the displacement, what we are really describing is how fast or slow the motion that is taking place is. But again, we aren't talking about speed here, because speed is a scalar. Instead, velocity must have a direction associated with it. Let's say that it took one and a half hours to walk from eastern to home. Then we can calculate your velocity by dividing your displacement, 5 kilometers in the positive x, by the elapsed time, 1.5 hours. So your velocity was 3.3 kilometers per hour in the positive x. So what do you suppose the velocity for the entire trip from campus to home and back is? Well, since the displacement is zero, then the velocity must also be zero. Does this make sense? Surely you were moving as you traveled from eastern to home and back. Again, this highlights the fundamental difference between the vector quantity and its scalar counterpart. While the velocity turned out to be zero, your speed during the trip is not. As it turns out, things are a little bit more complicated. We actually found the average velocity for the duration of the trip in this example. We could have instead asked the question, what was the instantaneous velocity at some point during the trip? And depending on the instant in time that we are interested in, the instantaneous velocity could have been some positive number, some negative number, or it could have been exactly zero. So how can we calculate the instantaneous velocity? Well, the key word here is instantaneous. What is the velocity at any instant in time? When we say instantaneous, what we mean is what happens when our time duration gets really small. In other words, the instantaneous velocity is the derivative of the object's position with respect to time. So in order to determine the instantaneous velocity at some point during the trip from campus to home and back, we need to be able to describe the position as a function of time. That function can be anything, really, but if I know the function, then I can find the velocity at any point. As it turns out, these two ways of quantifying physical quantities, by the average value and the instantaneous value, show up in other parts of physics as well. For example, acceleration. But before we think about the difference between the average and instantaneous acceleration, let's figure out what acceleration actually is first. The acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity. Again, since we are talking about the rate of change, we know that we are going to have to divide by time. In this case, the acceleration is the change in velocity divided by time. Using this definition, we can figure out the units of acceleration. We have velocity in the numerator, which has SI units meter per second, and time in the denominator, which has units of seconds. So acceleration has the units of meters per second per second, or in other words, meters per second squared.
Think of the units this way. If you have an object that is moving at some velocity in the positive x direction, but is accelerating at one meter per second squared in the positive x direction, that means that the object's velocity will increase by one meter per second for every second of time that passes. An object that is initially at rest and is accelerating at one meter per second squared in the positive x direction will have a velocity of five meters per second in the positive x direction after five seconds have elapsed. Since our basic definition of the acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity, just like before, we can define an average acceleration and an instantaneous acceleration. The average acceleration is the change in the velocity divided by the time. To get the instantaneous acceleration, we take the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. In order to determine the instantaneous acceleration of an object, we need to be able to describe the functional form of the velocity as it depends on time. Or if we combine our definition of the instantaneous velocity with that of the instantaneous acceleration, we can define the acceleration as the second derivative of the object's position with respect to time. If we know the functional form of an object's position with respect to time, then we can determine the object's velocity and acceleration as a function of time. We know everything about the object's motion.